Matthew chapter 18. Matthew 18, we're going to look at verses 1 through 9 today. Matthew 18, 1 through 9. If you don't have your Bibles with you, you can look on the screen. Matthew 18, 1 through 9. Now here's reading of God's word. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling, him, calling to him a child, he put him, on the midst, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and be thrown into the depths of the sea. Woe to the world for temptations to sin. For it is necessary that temptations come. But woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than to, well, with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell of fire. G-O-A-T, capital G-O-A-T. What is that term? What does that word stand for? Greatest of all time, the GOAT. This is often a very fun, I think, debate, yet very heated debate among, for example, sports fans. They want to know, they want to argue, who is the greatest? You know, I've had the fortune of watching Michael Jordan play basketball. and In my mind, I would consider him to be the greatest of all time. Greatest basketball player of all time. But there are others who would argue that it's LeBron James. I don't know why. <laughs> but there are those who would argue that it's Kobe Bryant. Yeah. Depending on, I guess, what city you're at. I know a lot of Laker fans, friends in California who say Kobe, it's Kobe. I was like, you know, Kobe is good, but he's no Jordan. So it's, it's, it's a great dialogue and debate. Sometimes it can get very heated. How about football? Is Tom Brady the GOAT, the greatest quarterback ever? You know, when we look at his accomplishments, it's very impressive. He has won more championships than anyone else. But what is the criteria that we use? And depending on the criteria that we use to argue or determine the GOAT, the person may change. If you use championships, Jordan, Brady. You say it's the most points ever scored by a person, well, I guess that would fall on LeBron because he just passed uh, Kareem for the most points ever scored. For those who follow skiing or ski racing, I uh, don't know if any of you do, alpine skiing, we are witnessing history even as we speak. Yesterday, I came downstairs in the morning. My daughter, Abby, was watching TV. I expected her to be watching uh, cartoons or whatever it is that she watches. She was watching ski racing. I was like, that's my girl. <laughs> she was watching the men's alpine race from Aspen, Colorado. I think it was a Super G. She's watching that and I said, oh, you know, Abby, there's a, there's a female skier. She's like one of the best. She's like, oh yeah, they mentioned her. During the broadcast, during the men's race, they talked about her. Her name is Michaela Schifrin. She is one of the greatest, if not the greatest, of all time. About a month ago, she surpassed the total number of victories, or the most number of victories, World Cup victories for a female skier. She passed that. But there was the highest, I think the most at that time was 83 or something like that. But the most victories of all time belonged to this guy who had 86 or 87 victories. So she surpassed the women about a month ago. And then this past weekend, she surpassed the most victories of all time, male or female. She will only add to that total because she's only 27 years old. 
She wins on average 10, 11 races a year. This year she has won 14. Her personal best is 17. 17 races in one season. She's on her way. There's several more races to go. This doesn't actually uh, count World Cup races. World Cup races, if you were to add that, she would have been uh, passed much sooner. Because this past World Cup, she won like four or five gold medals. Who is the GOAT? The greatest of all time. What is the criteria that we use? And this idea of the GOAT, the debate, the dialogue, it can be somewhat entertaining. But yet the question of who the GOAT is, is, is very intriguing to me. Why do we have such heated debates and arguments about who the greatest is? We talk about the greatest in terms of uh, athletes. We talk about greatest in terms of bands, right? There are some people who say, who, who is the greatest band? And you have various different opinions as well. The greatest, why do we need to know or why do we need to define who is the GOAT? Because whether somebody is the greatest or not, that has no bearing on our lives, does it? Just because I believe it's Jordan, I don't get any extra points along the life. Why this desire? Is it a fuel to motivate ourselves to achieve similar levels? Well, if somebody is setting out to be like a Jordan or a LeBron, um, the odds of them succeeding is extremely low. Do we am admire their success then? Do we admire the success or the prestige that may come with, de with declaring or being declared the greatest? I guess who doesn't like prestige, recognition? Apparently, the idea of who the greatest, it's not just something that happens in our day, day and age. The disciples were very curious about this as well. This leads us to our text this morning. They pose a question to Jesus. They pose the question just like many of friends and I have discussed. Who is the greatest so-and-so? Who is the greatest? We just, they, some, some of my friends just always want to know. They have to define it. We will look at their question first. And then look at Jesus' response this morning. And as we do that, what we will see is that Jesus has a formula for greatness. He reveals his formula for greatness. So the first question is this. Who is the greatest? This is the question that is thrown to Jesus by his disciples. Randomly, at uh, one time, boom, they come. They say, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? At that time, the disciples come to him in verse 1. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? This was the most pressing question for them in that moment. Matthew doesn't tell us, but Mark and Luke, in their gospel, when they talk about this, they mention the fact that the disciples were arguing among themselves who was the greatest. Can you picture that? They're arguing among themselves. No, no, I'm the greatest. No, man, you weren't there. You weren't there during the transfiguration. I was there. You're not the first person that Jesus calls. He calls me. Can you imagine the scene as they're walking? They're having this argument and Jesus walking along with them. It's just, oh, man, these guys. That was the argument that they were having. They were jockeying for position of power and influence. They were jockeying with each other for a significant role or position within the kingdom. Peter, James, and John, most definitely, they were part of the inner circle. Jesus spent additional time with them. On several occasions, they witnessed that transfiguration of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 20, it was not just the disciples who sought position of influence or greatness. We're told the mother of James and John also come to Jesus and say, hey, Jesus, when, when you enter your kingdom, when your kingdom comes, please have one of my sons sit on your right, the other on your left. It didn't matter for her if it was James 
or John sitting on right or left. It doesn't matter. For her, all she cared about was that both the sons would occupy the seats to the right and to the left of Jesus. The seats of honor. Position. Rank. Prestige. It's clear as we read through the uh, New Testament, especially the Gospels, it's clear that uh, the many people in, uh, in that time, they misunderstood uh, the kingdom. They misunderstood the, the role that Jesus would play. They really thought it was an earthly kingdom, a polit- that Jesus would come to establish a political kingdom on earth, overthrow the Romans, sit on his throne. That's why they were jockeying for position. They're like, you know what, when that day happens, I want to make sure that I am high in rank and position. They argued because they were curious. Man, what's it going to be like when Jesus' kingdom is established? This is the time that they're going to soon march towards Jerusalem. We're towards the end of his ministry, his life. When the time comes, they wanted to hold important roles. That's what they were jockeying for position. James and John's mom, she understood that too. And she sensed that as well. So she comes to Jesus. When they... When their mom does this, when James and John does this, we are told the other disciples were indignant. They were absolutely furious. Why do you think they were upset? They were upset because somebody else beat them to the punch. Oh man, I should have done it. I was going to do it. They were jockeying for position. So the question that they pose is, who is the greatest in the kingdom? What we'll see is that Jesus has a criteria for greatness. So Jesus will teach on this formula for greatness. He uses an unusual example first, and then he helps his disciples focus on service. There's two criteria that we see here for the greatness in God's kingdom. First one is this, be like a child. Jesus is saying, you want to be great? Be like a child. Look at verses 2 through 4. In calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them. The setting is that he's sitting in a room, in a house. Many scholars believe that this is Peter's house. So this is Peter's child. As the adults are talking, they come and they pose this question to him. Jesus says, come. And he has the child stand in the midst. And he uses the child as an example. He says, truly I say to you, Unless you churn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. We have to understand that a child in this day and age was a very unusual example to point to for something positive. Children had no, they were of no importance in Jewish society. They had no rights. They were vulnerable. They were often overlooked. They were powerless. Children had no status. They were seen, but not heard. This paints an idea or the perception that adults of Jewish society had toward children. They never gave a child a platform. This was very unusual. People would be like, child. And then throughout this chapter later on, what do we we see? He continues to be in the midst of children and bring children as an example. It's an odd analogy for sure. Because a child is definitely not the greatest in any Jew's mind of the time. How can they consider a child to be great? Jesus, we asked you, who is the greatest? And what is this funny business with Using this child as an example. Why would Jesus use a child as an example? He says, you must want who humbles oneself like a child. He means that they accept the position of a child, the inferior position of a child in Jewish culture. You want to be great? Accept the inferior position of a child in Jewish culture. I mean... How do we 
think the disciples are understanding this. Confused. Because in their mind, there's nothing great about children. Jesus says, if you want to be great in my kingdom, humble yourself like a child. No one in their right mind would choose the inferior position on purpose. A child is not concerned about status. There will come a time as they get older where that becomes more, uh, I think, uh, desired. But generally, children just status, no. They're not concerned about that. Children are trusting. These are the attributes that Jesus is pointing to. The humility of a child. They are not concerned about status. They are trusting. They trust adults. You know the answer that Jesus should have given? Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? You know what his answer should have been, right? Me. Jesus is the greatest. But he teaches He says, you know what, let me bring a child up here, a visual aid. You have to become like this child. Be like this child. Jesus is saying that they must take the position of the lowly child. That humility is the sign of greatness in Jesus' kingdom. Two criteria is one, he says, be like a child. Be like this child. Second criteria that he points to is this, learn to serve. Learn to serve. If you want to be great, learn to serve. The disciples wanted to be great in God's kingdom. They were after prestige, honor, and privilege. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 through 27, Jesus says this. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Well, what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will uh, repay each person according to what he has done. Greatness is measured by commitment to service. You see, the disciples' question reveals that their hearts were far from a commitment to service. What Jesus is teaching is that the kingdom cannot be gained by merit. Position of greatness is not determined by merit. The criteria is not what they have accomplished or their position as part of Jesus' inner circle. But they must put all their selfish desires down. They must seek to be the least among their fellow disciples. The argument that they should have had is who is the least among them, not who is the greatest. Jesus calls them to service. What does service look like? It is demonstrated by Jesus in John chapter 13, verse 4 and 5. He says this, So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. This is what service looks like. Jesus, their teacher and master, washed their feet. He washed the feet, a task that nobody volunteered for. A task that was considered so low that even Jewish servants would not be required to do. It was often foreign servants, their job, their task to wash the feet of the guests. That's how low they held this job or this duty or task, washing the feet of the guests. Disciples must have been stunned. And immediately as Jesus started doing that, immediately, they probably looked among themselves and said, oh, that's right, there's no one here, that's no one to wash our feet. The rightful thing would have been for one of the disciples to do that. But you remember the question they had and the argument that they had, who is the greatest? No one dared to move. Why? That would be an acknowledgement that I am not the greatest. But that was the argument they were having, right? 
Why would Jesus do this? The answer is found later in John 13, verses 12 through 17. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. And he asked them, do you understand what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set you an example you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Jesus shows them an example of humble service. I can't imagine how dirty feet were back in the day. They wore sandals. The roads were dirty, or dirt roads. <sighs> During the summer, most of you guys wear sandals. Okay, whether it's nice, dressy sandals or whatever, we don't wear socks. There are times when you just take off your feet or take off your shoes at nighttime. You look on the bottom, it's like dark. It's dark because of maybe the sandals you're wearing. It's also dark just because you're out and about. And we might take something and wipe our feet down so that it doesn't track all that, that you know, dirt into your carpet or your floors or whatever the case might be. I can't imagine. It's shocking for Jesus, their master and teacher, to do such a lowly task. The disciples probably stunned. Put this in the context of the argument that they had among themselves. Who was the greatest? It did not occur to them that maybe one of them should do it. We are told only Peter objected. There's a very interesting um, reason uh, that some argue that it was Peter. And Peter is the only one who uh, resisted. The way that the seating arrangement would have been uh, in this time is if you think about a, uh, a, this kind of a shape, right? The way that they ate in this time was they would recline on their left elbow. Their feet would be behind them. So they ate not sitting like the pictures that we see in a table and Jesus in the middle. The way that they ate in this season was having a table that was on the ground Reclining on your left hand, your feet going back, reclining away from you. And then if, if you can picture that scene where Jesus and his disciples are seated around the table that way, a servant could come and just casually wash the feet because the feet is away from the table. They would wash the feet, dry it, move on to all the guests. Jesus, as the teacher, would have had the seat of honor, which would have been if we're looking at a picture of this way, it would have been the second seat on this side. We know that Judas Iscariot also is next to him because there is, there's passages when he says, the one who I have dipped and given to, right? He is the one. And so we know that Judas would have been on Jesus' left side. Why? Because if you're on your left-hand side, to dip, to feed, well, Judas being on this side, he could give it to him here. But if Judas was sitting in front of him, it would be hard to feed him, right? So that's, we know that Judas is sitting on this side. And we also know that Peter motions to John saying, who is it? When Jesus talks to him about who is the one who's going to betray him, Peter's like, who is it? We know that John was also next to Jesus. So if Jesus is on this side, Judas is here, then John is on the first seat. And if John is on the first seat and he's reclining at the table, where can he see? He can't see much over here, but he can look straight across, and guess who's there? It's Peter. Peter's sitting at the very end. So Peter, all the way here. Most scholars believe that Peter ended up there. Why? Because when they got into the upper room, he was jockeying for the position. He was trying to go sit next to Jesus, but Jesus probably said, Hey, Judas, why don't you come sit here? And Peter's like, oh. And then John had already sat down. And by that time, all the other disciples filled this place. Only spot was left was the final spot. 
And that spot is very significant because that's where usually the servant would have been. Why does Peter object? He being in that position, it was his job to wash the feet of the guests. When Jesus approaches him, he understanding that perhaps makes the resistance. Fun little fact. Whether or not it was actual, we don't know. But people look at the passages and they start positioning. Because only those are the people that are mentioned in the upper room discourse. All the other disciples, they're just, they're just there. Peter's the only one that, reject, uh, that just objects. Jesus says, you know what? I have done this as an example. Do what I have done for you. Wash one another's feet. We are called to follow his example. Serve one another in loneliness of heart and mind. Sometimes we look at this passage and we think, yeah, man, I could wash the feet of somebody. If you've never done it, it's really hard. We did this at a retreat one time, youth retreat. Uh, this was when I was in California. Uh, we had about 240 uh, students in our church. Uh, we went to a retreat. Uh, and the youth pastor's like, oh, man, it's going to be great. Let's wash the feet. I'm like, I'm, immediately I'm thinking logistics, right? How are you going to do that? How are you going to keep the water clean? Or we're going to have extra towels? So I started saying, we need to get all this stuff. And he's like, no, man, we just wash feet. I was like, you got to change the water. He's like, no, you don't. I said, I'm going first. Then. <laughs> I said, no one is going to want to put their foot into dirty water. You got to change the water out. And the, some of the female teachers like, that's what we have to, you can't just keep using the same water. He's like, it's more symbolic. I said, dude, the water will get dirty. So we started doing that. The teachers, about nine teachers, pastors, we started washing the feet of the students. We used soap. I, I've never used soap before. We did it. We took soap. We literally washed their feet dried it out, then we had people changing, giving, changing water. So we went through as the students, and then something beautiful happened as we were doing this. Some of the high school boys, they're like, Pastor David, you gotta sit down. So he started washing his feet. And then they're like, P. John, get over here. They started washing my feet. Then they started washing all the pastors, about four or five of us. And then they started washing the teacher's feet. Then they started washing one another's feet. When the group of boys started doing it, the girls started doing it. Pretty soon, this continued. We expected this to last 10, 15 minutes max. Two hours later, everybody had clean feet. But it was the most beautiful thing that we saw as they started serving and started washing the feet of one another. Feet come on all sizes. All shapes. Podiatrists, man, I'm sorry. There, there are times when I'm just like, no, I'm not touching that foot. But this is an example that Jesus gave. He says, do as I have done. Sometimes we think that, I don't know, maybe there's something, a job or a task, you think, you know what, that's, that's beneath me. I'm not doing this. Sometimes we get resistance. We say, hey, can you do this? No, I'm not doing this. My kids have chores. Abby will empty the garbage. But the big garbage, well, she can't lift it anyways. But still, she's like, oh, I don't want to touch that. But she's okay to just empty the trash can from all the rooms and bathrooms. But there's certain jobs that we think, oh, no, I'm not sure I can, I can do that. Jesus demonstrates great humility. The disciples, uh, they needed to learn to serve. They needed to learn to serve others. In God's kingdom, to be great is to serve others in humility. Being great in God's kingdom is radically different than the standards of, standards of greatness in the world. Let me invite the worship team up. You know, most people at some point desire to have power, maybe be seen as great uh, by the world. 
we are bombarded with messages and images that celebrate people who are powerful, prestigious, famous, can be an, an athlete, entertainer, actors, CEOs, influencers, and so on. They're out there. There was a time when you would not hear so much about CEOs, but now this, you hear and read. It's like, you know, I don't really need to know. You know, the Amazon dude has a new boat, but it's in the news. People talk about it on YouTube. My son listens to whatever YouTuber, whatever channels, and they talk about all of these different things. Athletes, entertainers, actors, CEOs, influencers, they are out there. We celebrate. These, the images of them are constantly all over the place. We're bombarded with them. We cannot be consumed by our desires to become like them. And in the process, lose our way with God. How do people achieve position of honor, prestige, power? It's not through service. They do whatever means necessary. Whatever it takes, they will climb that ladder. Whatever it takes, they will find success. Compromises, doesn't matter. They set out to do that. That's not what Jesus is teaching. His formula is very different. Jesus' formula for greatness is, is vastly different. He says childlike humility, humble service are the keys. This will get you into the position of greatness in God's kingdom. It's a message that is very different. As we respond to this song this morning, as we respond and sing together this morning, the question that was posed was, who is the greatest? Jesus says, be like a child, learn to serve others.